All right. Well, this morning we are looking at Romans 8, verses 28 through 39. And I pray and hope the Lord uses this to encourage us. It will be challenging as well. But again, that whatever the conditions are that God um, places upon these promises, we know He provides in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not something we work up within ourselves, but something He gives to us by His grace. So remember that we're looking at Romans 8, and this morning, uh, Lord willing, we're going to finish uh, Romans 8. Not that there isn't much more that could be said about it, but um, we are trying to get through Romans perhaps a little more quickly than we have in the past. Uh, but Paul has been focusing on the Spirit's work in our lives. In the first 13 verses, how the Spirit works um, within us to make us more like Christ in our behavior. Uh, in verses 14 through 16, he, he shows us the work that He is doing in our lives to make us like Christ, to convince us that we are God's children. And as He pointed out in, in um, later verses, that that gives us the, the hope, the expectation that we will be a part of that new world that Jesus is going to bring when He returns to raise our bodies. Now, last, last week, no, I should say two weeks ago, we were reminded of how the Spirit of God helps us in our prayers. He shows us how important it is that we pray and what it is we should be praying for. He gives us the kind of desire that we need in our prayers for the Father to hear us. Remember that if we don't really want what we're praying for, then the Lord's really not going to hear and answer our prayers. We we need to desire these things, and as the, the Puritans remind us, the Spirit of God gives us that desire. He also gives us the confidence that when we bring our requests to the Lord, that He will receive them because He is our Father and we are His children. But we mainly focused on another way that the Spirit of God helps us, and that is He prays for us. Paul reminded us that we not only have an advocate in heaven, who loves us and intercedes for us, but we also have one within our souls who knows our weaknesses and prays that we would be able to overcome them and grow into Christ's image. Now, Paul rounds out the, um, the message in this particular chapter by telling us that if we love Him, and by the way, all these other things that we've just seen are also connected to that love of the Spirit. You know, to be led by the Spirit and so to become more like Jesus Christ is basically to give in to the desire the Spirit gives to us for the things God calls us to do. It, it's also connected to love. Well, this morning, Paul tells us that if these things are true of us, the Spirit of God is leading us, making us more like Christ, giving us this confidence then um, not only will God make sure that everything that we experience in life, everything that He brings into our lives by His sovereign plan, that He will use to help us on our way to heaven, but He will also make sure, as I've already told you, that nothing will ever take us away from Him while we're on our way to heaven. You know, this is really the essence of assurance that God is going to preserve us. And what I want us to see this morning is that's what God has promised. You know, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, if you have omnipotent power on your side, you see there's nothing that can stand in the way of His accomplishing His purposes. And that's really what this section is all about. Now, Paul begins by telling us that if we love God, we can know He will work everything that He brings into our lives for good. Now, I hope we all see that that condition is there in verse 28. Let me read it. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. And again, uh, let me remind you that loving God and being called by God according to His purpose, that's, that's the same thing. 
you know, in, in Scripture, you often have, uh, you know, in Hebrew, you have this parallelism where you have one statement and then you have another one that expands on that. And we have something of that here. This love is the result of being called according to his purpose. And we'll focus on that in just a moment. But if that's true of us, he says he will cause everything, okay, everything that happens to us in life, everything that, that we experience, you know, not surprisingly, the, you know, for, to work together for our good, not surprising the good things that he brings into our lives. And the Lord brings a lot of good things. And the best things are the times that we get to share with him in worship. You know, those who love the Lord want to spend time with him, right? So that's one of the best things. He works that for our good, obviously. Spending time with our brothers and sisters in the Lord, the fellowship we get to enjoy in, in serving him. And, of course, even in the material blessings, all these good things that God brings, we, we understand He works those for our good. But obviously, Paul has in mind something uh, a little bit different. He also brings or also works good out of the difficult things that we have to face, the trials that we have to endure. And not just trials, you know, as, as Peter says, for doing things that are wrong. You know, if you do things that are wrong and you suffer for it, well, that's what wrong things deserve. But when you do the right things and you suffer for them, you know, sometimes we endure various difficulties because we choose to do the right thing rather than what's expected by the world or what's accepted by other people. Uh, he's going to work the losses that we will experience in life, the loss of children, of, of their affection, of family members and friends who reject us because we're not agreeing with everything that they do, because we we tell them the truth because that's what Christ calls us to do. I mean, true love will speak the truth to family members. God will work good out of that as well. But he will even work good or work together for good the temptations and the sins that we fall into because of our weaknesses. Now, that's something really to rejoice in. We shouldn't try to fall into sin because God's going to work it together for good. But we do know that when we, we do our best and we still falter and fall, that God is going to use those things in our lives for good. And what Paul means by that is he'll use all these circumstances, all these things we have to go through to mold us and shape us into the image of his son. He'll use them to refine us. Uh, the, the idea has been used like a block of marble, you know, to chip away at it until the image of Christ shows through. The Spirit of God has already put the image of Christ in us, and we've got a lot of rough areas, lots of them. And so there's a lot of chipping away to do. But he's going to use all these circumstances to make us like Christ. Now, the fact that God does this not only reminds us that he is absolutely sovereign, the fact that he's the one who plans the things that come into our lives, and he works them all together for our good to... Um, again, for, for his sovereign purposes. But it also reminds us that God loves us. That he cares enough about us to bring these things into our lives to make us like his son. That's love. And we need to be thankful for it. And by the way, that's the only way this can happen. In our present state, you know, we have to experience trials and difficulties. That's the only way that we're going to become more like his son, as Jonathan Edwards would say, God is going to make us sick of sin. And that's one of the ways that he gets us to turn away from it and turn into the right paths. Now, uh, Paul says that we can know, again, that he is doing this for us, that he's going to work everything together for our good to make us more like Christ if we love him. And again, the passage, you know, he works all, all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are, calling, who are called according to our purpose. Now again, our love for God, not just for what God gives us, as I've said earlier in the service, but mainly for who he is, that he is holy and righteous, that we love him. That is the evidence that he loves us. It's the evidence that we have been called according to his purpose. Remember how I said those two passages or those two statements, phrases. Those, to those who love God, 
to those who were called according to his purpose, that they're almost synonymous because it's that calling that produces that love. It's the evidence, the love is the evidence that we are called according to his purpose, according to his eternal plan to bring us to glory. And that's the connection between what Paul says in verse 28 and what follows in verses 29 and 30, what has been called historically the golden chain. If we love God, that means we've been called. That means that, that we are in that chain, okay, the chain that begins with God's foreknowledge. Again, so many links in God's plan to bring us to heaven. Now, we're all familiar with this passage. We all love this passage as Calvinists because, again, it reminds us of God's sovereignty. This chain begins with, with His foreknowledge. And as we know, it's not His foreknowing that, that we would choose Him because apart from His gracious intervention in our lives by His Holy Spirit to change our hearts, we would never have chosen to come to Christ. What Paul is referring to here is God's foreloving us from all eternity. Knowing someone in Scripture does not always mean just certain, you know, knowing certain facts about someone. Someone's used this analogy, you know, that a political analyst knows the president, you know, he studies the president, he's, his life, his background, his choices, and he might even be able to predict what the president is going to choose. He knows the president. But the groundskeeper who sees the president every day and, and he um, says hello and they talk on a personal level, he also knows the president, you see, but not in the same way as the political analyst. Well, what Paul is referring to here is knowing God in the way the groundskeeper knows the president in a personal relationship, knowing in Scripture, knowing someone. It doesn't just mean knowing facts. It means knowing them in a relational sense. It means loving them. One example, Moses tells us in Genesis 4 that Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore a son, okay? What did he mean by that? That he got to know her, more facts about her, got to, you know, ask her more questions about her background? No, he was speaking about Adam's deep love for Eve and what that love produced. God's foreknowing us is his foreloving us. And it was because of this love that He had for us eternally, which never began, and the Bible tells us will never end, as we're going to see. It's because of that love that He predestined us, that He determined in eternity that He would turn us from being those who hate Him to those who love Him, okay? That, that's what it means to be predestined, to be conformed to the image of His Son. I mean, what is that image? It's an image of pure love and devotion to the Father. That is what He has determined to make us. See, it was also out of love towards His Son that He determined to make us like His Son so that He might give us to His Son as a reward for His work of redemption so that Jesus might be the firstborn, not the first one, although He, he is essentially the first one, but the preeminent one, the head of a new race of people who were just like Him. That is, we all love God. We all love the Father, that He might love us as His own forever. We are the reward. And again, we're not, we're a reward of sinful, redeemed people who are made like Him, that we all love the Father. Now, having determined to do this in eternity, in time, He called us. Now, as I mentioned before, Paul's not speaking here merely about the, the gospel call which goes out to many people, though it is through the gospel that this call is issued. He's referring to the inward call, that work of the Holy Spirit that brings about the new birth, that which Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. Okay, that work of the Spirit, this new birth, is what brings this love that we now have for God. And that's why Paul points to this love again and again as the only way that we can know, okay, that God has foreloved us, that God has chosen us, that He has predestined us, that He has elected us, that he is, it's by His calling, by the fact that we love Him. Think about what John writes in 1 John 4.19. We love because He first loved us. Our love is the evidence that God loved us, foreloved us, and chose us 
in eternity. Now, Paul goes on to say that if we love Him, we can also know that we're justified, which means declared you know, righteous in God's sight in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember what Paul wrote in our meditation we saw this morning? For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. The kind of faith that justifies us is not the faith without works. Okay, that's dead faith. But it's the faith that works by love, that produces a change in life. It's a, it's a loving faith that causes us to trust in Jesus. And it's also a loving faith that causes us to obey Jesus. Remember, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, if we have a loving faith, if we love Christ, if we love the commandments, and we show that we are by doing these things, then we can know that we have been justified. And if we know that we have been justified, then we also know that we will be glorified. Okay, that we will be with Jesus in heaven, that we will be with him in the new heavens and the new earth. Okay. All right, now if this isn't assuring enough, this is very assuring, uh, Paul actually strengthens this point in two further ways that, that aren't immediately obvious, and perhaps you've heard of them before. First of all, notice that Paul tells us that everyone who begins makes it also to the end. Did you notice that? Notice he doesn't say, some whom the Lord foreknew, he predestined. And some whom he predestined, he called. Some whom he called, he justified. And some whom he justified, he glorified. No, Paul doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, those whom he foreknew, he predestined. All of them. All of them make it all the way through the chain and nobody drops out. So if we are foreknown or foreloved by God, we will be glorified. That's good news, isn't it? Very good news. But notice, secondly, Paul uses the past tense for something that is yet future. Did you notice that? Those whom he justified. And we, we fall into that category. If we, if we love the Lord, if we're trusting Jesus, you know, that love is what makes us trust him. And it's by faith, but it's a faith that works by love. If that's true of us, we're justified. But do you notice that Paul says we are also already glorified? He's using the past tense. And what that means is our glorification is so sure to take place, Paul can speak of it as something that is already done. I don't know if you ever noticed, but in Ephesians 2, when Paul talks about our union with Christ, and he says, you know, we were dead, but God made us alive and seated us, past tense, with Christ in the heavenly places. He's talking to a people who are alive. And he says, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places now. So, again, it's so certain to take place that he speaks of it as something already done. We call that the already and the not yet. It's the already, we're already glorified with Christ. It's certain to take place, but the not yet... The reality is we're here. We still have things to face, but we have the hope that we're going to be with him forever. So Paul's first point is this. If we love the Lord, he's going to work everything together for our good. Not only will he begin to make us more like Christ here, but he will bring that completion to work in heaven through all the circumstances that we have to face on earth. Okay, again. Wonderful news, great news. This is what our assurance is actually based on, God's promise. Okay. But Paul doesn't stop there. He gives us several more arguments to prove this in the remaining verses, and these I think we can deal with fairly, fairly quickly. Now, he begins with an overarching statement. What then shall we say to these things? You know, to the things he's just told us in, in verses 28 through 30, Maybe in the whole of Romans chapter 8. If God is for us, who or what is against us? Well, whatever it is, it's, it's you know, inconsequential. Nothing, nothing can stand against him. So then he begins to note some of the things that might be able to stand against us. What about our need? Can we know that God will provide for us through life? Well, Paul says in verse 32, He who did not spare his own son 
but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? See, this is an argument from the greater to the lesser if God gives us the greatest possible gift. You know, what is most precious to him, his son, to go through such suffering for us, to live, to suffer, and to die, how could he possibly withhold anything? You know, God is going to provide. Well, what about the devil? You know, what about the principalities and powers and the demonic things? When, when Paul says not angels, you know, he's not talking about holy angels. They're not going to stop us. Well, what about the devil who might bring an accusation, who might bring charges against us? Will he bring charges that will stick and that will actually condemn us to hell? You know, Paul, I should say, John calls him in Revelation 12.10, the accuser of the brethren. And he is constantly accusing us to ourselves as well as, of course, to the, to the Lord. Well, Paul continues, who will bring a charge against God's elect? The devil may try, but he won't be able to make them stick because God is the one who justifies. Remember, Jesus, he gave Jesus to die for our sins, and that took away all of our guilt, past, present, and future. He was raised for our justification, which means that by raising him from the dead, God declared that our sins were paid for. And so, again, we are justified. Um, if, if Jesus' death had not paid for those sins, he would still be in the grave. So that was Jesus' justification, and it was the assurance that we are forgiven and that we are justified. And, Paul says, he is seated at the right hand of God, constantly interceding for us. And his conclusion is, who can condemn us if all of these things are true? God has justified us through His Son, and there's no way we're going to be condemned. Well, what about our earthly enemies? Will they be able to take us away from God? Verse 35, Paul writes this, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, perhaps better, hunger, or nakedness or peril or sword? Now, what are these things? These are the things that the world dishes out against believers. Paul quotes from the Old Testament to show us that this is how God's people have always been treated by the world. Not, not well, okay? He says in verse 36, Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But, okay, so these are the things we're going to have to face. Are they going to overcome us? He says no. He says in verse 37, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Now, think about, think about the thing he just mentioned here, the things he just mentioned. Tribulation, distress, persecution, hunger, nakedness, peril, sword. Can you think of any believers who have ever gone through these things? Okay. Uh, can you think of any one of Christ's servants who hasn't been hated and persecuted by the world, right? The world hates Christians, Jesus said. Well, think about Peter, James, John, and Paul. How did the world treat them? Well, they were hated. What was the end? They were all martyred, okay? What about Huss? What about Tyndale? What about those gentlemen we're going to see this evening who were considered heroes of the faith? Cranmer, Latimer, and Ridley? How did the world treat them? Okay, they were hated, and these individuals were burned at the stake. John Wycliffe, you know, who wanted to bring the Bible into the English language, he, uh, he died before they could burn him at the stake, but 43 years later, they declared him a heretic, burned, uh, they dug up his bones, and they, they burned his bones. <laughs> Again, to show, in their view, that he was excluded from the kingdom of heaven. But he was hated, uh, and abused by the world. Think about Luther and Calvin and Whitfield and Edwards. You know, how did the world receive them? Again, they were hated and they had to face many, many difficulties. But would we want to argue that any one of them did not gain a complete victory in the Lord Jesus Christ? In all these things, Paul says, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Jesus has taken the sting out of death. 
by dying and rising from the dead. Death is now our entrance into heaven. Persecution is simply a means of gaining honor along the way. You know, God's going to work even those persecutions together for our good. And so what is the bottom line? Verses 38 and 39, Paul writes this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, Paul says death will simply usher us into heaven as we've already seen. The Lord's going to work everything together in life for our good. James tells us that no demonic power can overcome us, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Our present and future trials and afflictions are only working for us an eternal weight of glory, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4.17. Powers, governmental authority, cannot do any permanent injury to us. Again, can only increase our honor that we're going to receive from the Lord as we remain faithful to Him. Position and riches will not ultimately tempt us away from God, nor will the most difficult circumstances that we might have to endure. Nor, he says, will anything else in the created realm, okay, nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ. So, again, remembering what Paul said was the condition, if we love God this morning, and that's how we know. We're in the chain. That's how we know we're going to be glorified. That's how we know nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Not only will the Lord work everything together for good in our lives, but He will provide for us and protect us until we arrive in heaven. Paul tells us that we have an absolute assurance that we're going to be with Him. And so what what can we do? You know, what, 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 how can we repay the Lord? What, what should we offer to the Lord for all of His benefits toward us? Well, there's no way we can repay Him, and He doesn't want us to repay Him because, really, our works are, are filthy rags. They always will be. They're only received in Christ. What He wants us to do is love Him. He wants us to worship Him, not just here, but, you know, with our whole lives and in everything we do, loving Him and all of our choices in other words, living like Jesus. That's, that's how he wants us to live. Jesus didn't live the way that he did merely to save us. He lived that way to give us an example of how we are to live. That our meat, our drink, if I can put it that way, our food and, 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 and water, whatever, is to serve him, is to obey him, is, is to do his work and his will. That, that's what the Lord desires from each one of us, and that, again, is how we know we are called and how we're going to make it to the end. So as we uh, prepare to come to the table this morning, let's be reminded of what that salvation, that assurance cost uh, the Father, what it cost the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's, again, purpose in our hearts by God's grace. He doesn't want us just to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. He wants us to call upon Him and ask for His help and for His Holy Spirit to grow in this love so that we might, again, live as He calls us to live for His glory and praise. Let's, let's spend then just a few moments in prayer as we prepare to come to the table.